the end of this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Burchard. As you know, uh, for the last three, uh, let's say about three weeks or so, we've been uh, covering issues here within the African-American community, preferably northeast Portland for those of, who are living outside the city of Portland. And um, uh, and I, I thought that uh, what we do this particular round was at the first 30 minutes of the, we're going to open up the line and uh, give you an opportunity to comment. Uh, the, the guests were... Were several guests. There were, were two two guests, in particular. One one person there actually had two shows, and I'm talking about Baruthi Artery, who had been recently. Um, uh, actually, he he, uh, he basically uh, left his job with the city of Portland under uh, under Mayor Mayor Hale, Charlie Hale, in regards to an issue that um, that happened at uh, at a presentation that he had. Uh, that he was uh, representing the mayor at the diversity, I think it was a diversity thing or some sort. But anyway, we had two shows, and, and people were very interested in, uh, in what was being said and uh, in regards as far as uh, uh, Baruti uh, Archery had, had made statements he had made in events and whatever, such that, and we not, as I said, we, did, we didn't open up the, uh, the line because I thought it, was, it would have been fair to just give him an opportunity to articulate uh, his positions uh, we have we do still do have one or two more shows to be uh, that he will be here uh, and be making a presentation, and then and, and part of the other the other person that made the the, the piece was was uh, was with me actually it was two people with me actually it was it was um, it was Fred Stewart. Fred is a very active uh, business person here within the Portland metropolitan area, more specifically in real estate and all. But he's also a very civic-minded individual, in that he participated in uh, community activities and whatever. So. So it was a good thing, and so we had him on, and we talked a little bit about the the the, um, uh, the Trader Joe's situation. We talked about um, the, maybe some issue of gentrification and housing and the like, and I thought that was very interesting too. And so, so when we open up the line, Fred is here with me today, and what we're going to do, we're going to just sort of maybe just give you again the opportunity to um, to share your thoughts, and if you can, just be as, as direct as you can, and so we can just get as many folks on as we possibly can. And then the second time around, as you know, uh, well, you know, hey, uh, things are going now as far as the campaigns are concerned. And uh, we're going to open up the show and start talking a little bit about uh, about politics and what's going on here within our immediate area. And uh, there are many issues on the table. And, uh, and, and again, like I said, uh, we could probably lead this thing off on the second half. That, that uh, I'm also going to be a part and parcel of the, the election process. I'm going to be running for county commissioner. And uh, I, I got a little small tape of something that goes back a little history again. Like Fred always like that little history part. About five years ago, when I when I ran at that point in time for the, the Senate seat, and uh, I think Senator White was then the was then the um, the incumbent or the the sitting uh, person. And uh, so anyway, I thought it would be of interest to you. And then Fred and I are just going to get into that. And Fred's going to ask some questions, and we're going to just kind of like talk a bit about some of the elections, some of the some of the some of those elections that are that are of interest, let's put it this way, to the Oregon Voters Digest and others here in the community. Okay, with that, uh, what we'll do is that uh, you can open up the line, and uh, you can open up the line, you'll, you'll see the, use the number on the screen, uh, give us a call, and when you do call, uh, put your numbers down, I mean, put your phone, up, well, put the volume down on your TV set, and you'll be more good. Like I said, it's, it's open up. Uh, if you had the opportunity to see the show last week, or the last three shows, open it up, no problem. Fred, welcome. How's it going? How's it going? How's it going? How's it going? Well, what do you think? I mean, uh, in, in regards to uh, uh, some of the comments that were made on, you, you saw, I'm sure you saw all series, including yourself for that matter. What kind of feedback did you get from the uh, from some of the folks uh, out there in the in the city of Portland? All over the place, mostly good, of course. Uh -huh. I mean, most people, I think Broody, think me, we're seeing a lot of things that a lot of people are, are feeling. You know, m most people, you know, for good reason, you know, they don't want to... They don't want to be hard on people. This is a very tough thing. The black community right now, I think, is going through a very interesting time in its mm -hmm. Oregon history. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think right now, uh, this is a very, very uh, self-reflective mm -hmm. time for the black community. Mm -hmm. And um, no, as well as exciting. Yeah. I mean, I tell everybody, I, I always keep in mind that we've got the most educated, most experienced, the most accomplished black community we've ever had. It still isn't where we should be. Mm -hmm. um, we can't blame white people for all of our issues that we've got today. So it's very good that we're looking inside. We're looking at people who have failed us. Not everybody who's failed us is white. 
We've been failed by plenty of black people. Um, we've got to make changes. Mm. And, we've, and, and those changes start from inside. Mm -hmm. Start from how we ourselves perceive ourselves, mm -hmm. um, from accepting where we failed to accepting where we succeed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, like I said, it's a very interesting time for the black community of Oregon right now. What do you think, the, and, and, and we're just chatting to him, because the issue of the Trader Joe's situation was a very interesting one. I mean, the fact that it was going to be developed there on the corner of MLK, right, mm -hmm. and, and Alberta, right? Correct. And that empty site aspect of it. And there's still been some talk, and you know, people are still trying to figure out where where we're going to go with this. Is the trade? Do you think the Trader Joe's going to be? Built? I think there's still hope. I mean, I'm not going to give up. I really hope it comes together because it's it's the perfect fit, and I really do feel that um, it's going to be possible uh, to communicate to Trader Joe's that the people who who intimidated them away aren't the people who live within the community. And uh, like I said, this is a very interesting time. We we literally had black people who have done nothing absolutely nothing for the ep economic growth of the black community, let alone for the city of Portland. Mm -hmm. um, and half of which don't even live in Portland anymore. Um, scare away uh, a multi-billion dollar corporation from locating in inner north and northeast Portland. Mm -hmm. it, it's something that's never happened in inner northeast Portland history. Um, no, never happened in the black community. We've never had a, an issue where we've had to tell black people who don't live in Portland um, to basically step aside and shut up. Because mm -hmm. usually people who don't live in Portland don't try to speak for people in Portland. Well, if they, <laughs> well, take this out. Well, then let's say, for instance, if they opted to say come back, um, what, what, what about the people who objected initially? You think they would maybe demonstrate or... You know, it would be very dangerous for them to demonstrate. There's a lot of hot feelings. Mm -hmm. I would say that, um, it, it, you know, people do what they want. Mm -hmm. But I think it would be very dangerous, not just for, to them physically, but I think relationship-wise here in Oregon. All these people have jobs, a lot of them with the government. Some of them have, with nonprofits and stuff like that. And I, I would think that any, any black person who would step out against Trader Joe's in any way, if Trader Joe's decided to come back, they would find their relationship and economic opportunities pretty limited in this town for some time to come. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when the, when the package deal was pretty well put together, it, it, it was laid out, if you want, in the media, mm -hmm. from the standpoint that the property was worth two point some million dollars. 3.5. 3.5 million dollars, and, mm -hmm. and it was sold to a majestic realtor, basically the realtor mm -hmm. that Trader Joe's tend to work with, actually around the country for that matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, and people were kind of figuring, wow, I mean, why is it that this property was worth $3.5 million and it was being sold uh, to a, a builder, owner, developer type for, for $500,000? Well, Bruce, that's, that's business, that's as, business usual as usual in an urban renewal zone. Right, but, right. And that's what I wanted in the last show people to understand. One of the things I wanted to understand, you allow opportunities like that to happen mm -hmm. for the opportunity for small business, of any race, yeah. but also minority business, in this case, black business, have an opportunity to play in that ball field. Mm -hmm. Odds are your average black person is that is in business is not going to have the equity to do a deal like that. So that's where urban renewal comes in. It wasn't meant to give billionaires, such as Majestic Realty, mm -hmm. that type of benefit. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to speak out about it, because I said, since they weren't going to work with Ray Leary, the mm -hmm. black guy who brought Trader Joe's here, and decided to work with the billionaire white folks from Missouri, they should have expected the, the, the billionaires to pay full boat, pay, pull, pay, pay full price. They did not need the discount that was the, because they're neither a small business nor are they minority owned, neither one of the two. So that was one of the problems I've, I, I had. But also a big problem, and I, and I, and I, I, I could tell a lot of people caught on to this, we have black people who didn't live inside the Northeast Portland at all and come in and speak up and try to take control of that location, have mm -hmm. a say-so in that location. Mm -hmm. And the proof of their disconnect with the community and their lack of respect for the people of Portland and the, people of, the black people of the community is, one, they basically said that everything that had happened before them didn't matter. 19 years worth of community involvement didn't matter at all because they weren't involved, personally. Two, they didn't stand up for the black guy who got X'd out of the whole deal. You understand? They, they said, no, give us the deal and we're gonna make it better. 
And I gotta tell everybody, this was a very, very, very important moment in black history. We've never had black leaders this aggressive toward the black community before in a negative way. We've never had this before. You know, Dr. Wren thing, uh, Nickerson, Jackson, uh, Ford. Oh my God, I mean, the, the who's who of black leadership is rolling around in their grave. It's like black people turning in on each other. It's horrible, hmm. you know? But, you know, maybe it's an important moment. Um, like I said, an important self-reflection uh, reflection moment on the black community. You know, what is it like being black in Portland? You know, how do we contribute? How do we, you know, um, fight the, the crab in the bucket syndrome? Yeah. The, the whole thing. You would agree that the, the community has changed in terms of numbers. I mean, the, the, word, the word gentrification keeps coming up, but there's the move deal, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, but the thing but, is... Is that, or is that fact? This is not? the first... We're, uh, we're probably the second generation of black people who weren't forced to live someplace. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be surprised that as black people um, have become more educated, more wealthy, we're not as wealthy as we need to be. We're nowhere near, on average, where white people are, but we're wealthier. We're probably the wealthiest generation ever in Oregon, the mm -hmm. black generation. Mm -hmm. um, that they want to move out and move to places of their own choosing, do something that their parents and grandparents couldn't do. You know, when my grandfather moved to Portland in 1935, his options of, limit, uh, of, of where he could live in Portland were pretty limited. Um, he lived on First and Broadway. It's a parking lot now, but it's a parking lot right across the street from the, from the Ford uh, yeah, uh, yeah. business over there. Mm -hmm. That was pretty much where he lived because that's where the, one of the areas where black nice. people were, were, allowed, were, were to. allowed to live. Uh -huh. Allowed to live. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, so, yeah, we're going to have some gentrification, but the gentrification that we've got right now, I think it's a good gentrifica gentrification. The community is, is better. The community is, vi is vibrant again. It's safer to live there again. Um, you know, black people who stayed have benefited from the growth, just like white people who, who come yeah. in and benefited. And most importantly, you know, a black person who lives in Tigard, Lake Oswego, Bull Mountain, yeah. um, you <laughs> yeah, know, no on the Sandy River and stuff like that. They lived there because they chose to. And there is nothing that prevented them from doing it. They didn't have to worry about neighbors you know, marching against them or threatening to kill them or killing their pets or anything like that. You know, they mm -hmm. were able to make a decision yeah. where they wanted to live and they moved there. And I, I can't help but celebrate that. You know, and I think we should all celebrate it. The alternative is what we had in Portland just a generation ago. My, they were basically redlining and forcing black people where to live in Portland, Oregon, the day I was born. December of 64. <laughs> you know, hmm. they were literally still telling black people where they couldn't and where they could live and using the Portland police to enforce that. Mm -hmm. So you could say in a way this is the first generation of black people who've been able to go out and do what they want, live where they want, and I think that should be celebrated. Mm -hmm. So what, what what is the demographics of that of that community now at this point in time, you think? It's kind of fuzzy, but what, what I will say this, we've got, for the first time probably in 80, 90 years, um, just as many black people that live outside of Portland as we do that live inside of Portland, mm -hmm. um, and that's dropping. Mm -hmm. um, what I've been told, by the year 2030, certainly most black people won't live in Portland. Mm -hmm. By the year 2030, mm -hmm. that's not long mm -hmm. from now. But then property value, man, by Jesus Christ. What's the definition of property value over there now? Well, the property values are going right back to where they were 100 years ago. When I say 100 years ago, this was a very expensive area to live in 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, um, houses in the neighborhood that I live in averaged about $2,500 uh, to $4,000 a house. Mm -hmm. 100 years ago, that was a lot of money for a house. That was a whole lot of money for a house. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going back to that again. Mm -hmm. we're, 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 and the black people, the thing is different is 100 years ago, black people did not participate at all unless they were servants, mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah, know what yeah. I mean, or laborers. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was the limit of their participation. Today, if they own real estate, and we still have black people who own real estate in the area, yeah. they are participating in the economic growth just like everybody else, mm -hmm. period. I mean, give, me an example, give, us, give us some of the example of some of the prices, the numbers that are going out there well, for some of these houses. I got a house on Rodney that just, you know, it's listed right now for 950000 and it's sold. 
You said uh, 90000 950000 Yeah, that house hasn't been worth 90000 since the early 90s. Jesus. Yeah, it's been that's, 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 that's 950000 yeah. what, 11 years or 12 years? Yeah, 14 and years. that's on Rodney, just north of, uh, of Alberta Street See. in the Walnut Park area. But I've also got another house in Rodney just off of Sacramento for three fifty. You know, and I know when I first started selling real estate in nineteen eighty eight, I would sell houses like that for five thousand or less. Hmm. Now hmm. it's three fifty. Hmm. Hmm. And um, you know, we got a lot of people moving into the community. We got a, a, a lot of people who are contributing to the community. Um, we got more commercial um, opportunities, retail opportunities than we've had since the mid nineteen fifties. You know, I was telling some people when I was over at the Tin Bucket, uh, which is an awesome uh, bottle shop on Williams Avenue, the Tin Bucket, that the last time Williams Avenue was this vibrant would have to be the late 1950s. Mm. Would, mm. would have to be, right mm. around there. What about crime? I mean, uh, where, where, did, where did the crime go to? Some Crime's say, moved out of the area. Went back, it went east, right? It's, it's gone Russian east and, and gone north. Wow. It's gone east and north. And, you know, the one thing I, 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 w I just wish somebody would study more, um, a lot of the people who are criminals, they come from criminal families. I'm talking about the black community. I'm not, I don't know the, of the white community as much as I know the black community. But a lot of these criminals, if you would interview them in prison, you would find their dads were criminals, their granddads, their great-granddads going back to 80, 90 years worth of black history in Portland. Mm -hmm. So as these families are being, you know, pushed out of Northeast Portland for one reason or another, mm -hmm. they're going, wherever they're going, they're taking their crime with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, it's, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, like my grandfather said about these same families when I was a kid, you know, it is what it is. And they used to say, why are they doing that? And granddad, mm -hmm. he goes, mm -hmm. that's what they do. Mm -hmm. I do what I do, which he was a boot black, mm -hmm. shoe shiner, they do what they do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. You know, when you think about the whole issue of crime, you know, we, there's been many, many programs talking to trying to curtail that, you know, transition that, rehab that, recycle that, whatever, and get those folks back into community. Uh, but for some strange reason, it, they've never been able to uh, accomplish there's, that. You know, you can't help anybody that doesn't want to be helped, but you especially can't help a violent person until they're old. I mean, history has shown us a violent person in their 20s usually doesn't calm down until they're in their 50s or 60s. Mm -hmm. So keeping them out of prison before then just doesn't, it just ain't going to work. Yeah, but, but percentage-wise, you know, when you think about it, isn't jobs a factor if you want? In, in jobs a factor, but jobs is a factor more in the property crimes than it is the violent crimes. If you want, and, and, and you got to remember, the more crime you have in general, the more likely you're going to have some violent crime. Mm -hmm. But the drug war has a huge impact. Uh, on crime, if we didn't invest so much time and effort in putting making people criminals for drugs, we would have less, you know, crime, um, more business opportunities, less crime, and if we had more business opportunities uh, in the black community, we would have less, prop you know, black people committing property crimes and other crimes in that area. So yeah, you know, it does have, but the, when it comes to violent crimes, that's the one that's hurt the black community the most. And there's only one cure for a violent criminal. And that's a very, very long periods of time in prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you really want to help the black community in Oregon? You want to help the, you know, Oregon in general? Stop the drug war. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. stop putting people in prison or, or making them criminals, lifelong criminals for, you know, for drugs, especially mm -hmm. marijuana. Stop making them criminals because it, we, we've learned now over 70 years of this war, and I, you make a young man or a young woman a criminal when they're a teenager or a young person um, over drugs, it does not make the community safer. It doesn't help us economically in any area other than maybe uh, allow a few more people to, you know, to have secure jobs in the correctional facilities, but that's about it. <laughs> it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't help us. Well, you know, I, I'm sure that people up in the in East County are having some some concerns about the fact that uh, maybe they they have a lack of law enforcement things that you know you can be out of, I'm just on the outlining areas mm -hmm. being able to cope. And then you got that divide thing. Here we go again. You know, the divide between races mm -hmm. uh, going into those neighborhoods. What, what do you think? Well, you know, they should have they have good reason for it. I'm I'd be more worried about the violence that's going to be attracted around the drug war, mm -hmm. because when people can't make money, they're going to do things to make money, and that leads to the opportunity for, you know, for violence, you know, conflicts mm -hmm. that lead to violence. Uh, 
you know, East County, Multnomah County in general needs to look and see what's going on in Washington County when it comes to the high tech community and figure mm -hmm. out how it can compete. I, I have I've never understood why Multnomah County can't compete with, with, with Washington County when it comes to cre job creation in the high tech industry. Um, we're going to have to do something to, to get into this paper chase. But then, then, but then at the same time, there was a big push, let's say, in the Washington County area to import these folks and give them the jobs. Uh, high tech, right? Graduates well, from yeah. overseas, right? Yeah. Fair? Yeah. Yeah. They've got they've got a whole different segment of a neighborhood, you know, over there as it composed. To yeah, but still, the majority of people who work in that in that industry are Americans, and a huge percentage of them, you know, are from Oregon. I mean, but you're right. We got a lot, a lot of foreigners. Of, you got a lot of foreigners. We do have a lot of foreigners there. We, we graduated. Do. We do. Came. But you know what? I wouldn't mind if those foreigners uh, decided to live in Gresham, mm -hmm. and drive a few miles yeah, to right, their to right, their to right. the, wherever they worked in Gresham. Right, right. You know, we need to find a way for Multnomah County to start competing with Washington County. For these jobs, mm, yep, it, right. it, I mean, fair. I don't know how that's how it's going to be done, but if 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 Multnomah County doesn't find a way to get into the job race, into the what I call the paper chase, um, when we have what we had in Northeast Portland twenty years ago, twenty five mm -hmm. years ago, occur, and it's going to eventually occur someplace, mm -hmm. it's going to be worse, and it's going to be a lot harder to fight, a, a heck of a lot harder to fight, but it's not too late. I mean, right now, uh, you know, East, you know, with all the available land in, in Multnomah County, all the available opportunities in Multnomah County, uh, we can compete with Washington County. Hmm. But that means getting jobs here. Yeah, we could. And getting serious jobs. We could. A lot of times, most of it is basically being on service. And, and we know to help people. A serious job, in my opinion, is a job that pays at least $20 an hour now. Okay. Okay, a serious hmm. job, a full-time job at $20 an hour or more. That is what... I think everybody who's running for office, every lawmaker should yeah. be trying to figure yeah. out well, how that. can we help industry yeah. Yeah. develop $20 an hour or more jobs, mm -hmm. full-time uh, $20 an hour or more, or more jobs. That's, um, I ain't saying it's going to, you know, the solutions are going to happen overnight, mm -hmm. but that has to be the goal. That mm -hmm. has to be what everybody's pushing for. Mm -hmm. How can we attract companies that pay like that uh, to come here to this market? You know, how can we find um, uh, businesses uh, that are willing to invest in this market to expand mm -hmm. current businesses that are here that are willing to expand their footprint? Yeah, yeah, and, in, yeah. and, and not just in Oregon, but for sure, Multnomah County. But to get the kind of stock, if you will, to want to run for office, you have to basically be trying to draw from people who are, maybe have the capacity to do that or the mindset to do that. But most of those folks don't want to get involved. I mean, it's just a total social kind of a media kind of a deal. Well, and a lot of these folks don't really understand what the issues are, what the serious issues are. Well, Bruce, I agree, and that. that's why I'm always encouraging business people um, and people with a lot of business experience uh, to, to join, I mean, to, mm. to, to, you know, to run for office. Mm. I think one of, our, one of the negatives in our market is we don't have a lot of our uh, business people yeah. um, getting involved in public service even just for a little while. Right, right, right. I'll tell you what we're going to do, Fred. We're going to go down and take a short break, and we're going to get into that subject matter. And just as a little entree, a little historical piece, when, mm -hmm. when I ran against, uh, well, I, well, I ran, it was 2004, I did a piece uh, basically running through out of Oregon, mm -hmm. and those were some of the concerns, similar kind of concerns, and then basically getting to the table mm -hmm. and letting folks know in Oregon that uh, we have people of color that are, that, are, that are qualified, more than qualified, if you will. I mean, mm -hmm. Jim Hill was another person during that particular era, during that particular time that was very much involved and the like. And so we're going to look at that piece, and then we're going to get up and just kind of bring it up to date and talk about where we go from here. Okay, and sounds you, good. You may want to ask me a couple of questions. Oh, uh, well, I've definitely got a couple of questions to ask you. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this tape, too. All right, good. We're going to take a short break, folks, and we'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
Oregon Voters Digest. Through the years, I have been using the Oregon Voters Digest to make Oregon whole. The definition of the Oregon Voters Digest back in 1915 stands today. The Oregon Voters Digest. A digest of legislation, finance, industry, taxation, and public affairs in Oregon statewide. Published each month. Founded by the late great C.C. Chapman in 1915, the Oregon Voters Digest has for over 68 years been the political and financial bible for the state's leaders. Politicians, business people, and professionals of all kind have found the Oregon Voters Digest as an indispensable handbook and guide. It has provided a stream of clear, concise, and complete information and analysis on public affairs, taxation, business, and finance. The influence of the Oregon Voters Digest in Oregon's public affairs is legendary. Again, through the eyes of video productions, I've had the opportunity, again, through making Oregon whole, by interviewing individuals throughout the state of Oregon on the Oregon Voters Digest talk show. It has been very, very interesting. Take a look at what we've got to share with you in terms of the impact of the Oregon Voters Digest. Hey, we're here live at the Capitol, and, and uh, our guest today is, uh, is Senator, the, Senator Vicki Walker from Eugene. And naturally, one of the major concerns here that, that's facing our state is naturally the, the whole issue of unemployment, the economic issue, education. We are definitely in a dire need, and one of those areas is education. There, there, was, there was some issues that were that, that's, that's surrounding the confirmation hearing of, um, of Neil Goldsmith. Now you're running for mayor. Mm -hmm. Retired as, as, as chief not too long ago. And uh, so what, 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 why do you want to do this? What's the deal? Well, you know, for the last few years, I really felt like our city was drifting. There's the indicator uh, we're going to get into ballot measure Thursday. I mean, that's the, that's the hottest thing going at this point in time, as you know. I, did, I was able to get uh, a member from the uh, Republican Party and I'm talking about a guy by the name of Tim Tricky. He's a Multnomah County Republican Party's political director, Tim. Then we've got uh, Dan Fitzgerald, who represents the Libertarian Party. And then as far as the Democratic Party, for some strange reason, he hasn't shown up yet. But what we're going to do, we're going to make sure there's equal time here. They have taken a position, and we've got the voters' pamphlet here, and I'm going to read that position. Ann Nice, president of the Portland Association of Teachers. Mm -hmm. Who's Ann Nice? <laughs> it's a good question. Welcome to the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm your host, Bruce Broussard. With me today are gubernatorial candidates Danny Smith and Craig Berkman. We'll be discussing briefly the background of each candidate and also cover some of the issues surrounding crime, school funding, maybe the environmental issues, and taxes. To begin our discussion is Danny Smith and also his wife, Deanna. Welcome, Danny. And Deanna. Parents were involved in the political realm when I was a kid. My dad was governor. With me the, uh, these next few minutes is Craig Berkman. Uh, as you know, he's a candidate uh, running for governor of Oregon. Welcome, Craig. Nice to be with you. Craig, uh, tell me, why do you want to be governor of Oregon? Well, I think, uh, like all the candidates who are running, uh, I think I can make a constructive difference. Joining us the first half of our show is John Kitzhopper, Democratic candidate for governor. And we're going to discuss some of the issues that concern us all, such as crime, education, government spending, and the various ballot measures. And I'm talking to Elaine Colgan and also Lynn Bernstein. Tonight, we're going to really get down to the issue. So hopefully, uh, between us uh, and what you're going to hear tonight, you'll be able to get some, uh, maybe get a sense in terms of how to go out to the polls. By the way, I want to encourage you to get out and vote. Uh, you fans on, the, on KBOO, we're also televising uh, this particular hour. And we're going, what we're going to do is going to benefit uh, uh, the viewers of uh, the, the talk show, Oregon Voters Digest. So. I'm Bruce Broussard, and uh, welcome again to um, the uh, Portland Public Schools No Child Left Behind Forum. Uh, the whole focus of this particular gathering, if you will, is to focus on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the seats that are going to be sought after, if you will, by a number of Portlanders as far as the school board is concerned. When you start talking about taxes and unemployment, talking about unemployment and things of that nature, is definitely a nonpartisan position. And please, let's get away from the partisan position on this issue. Trust me, people who are working in government are Republicans, Democrats, Independents, all kinds of folks. 
People who are paying taxes are Republican, Democrats, Independents, and all kinds of people. People who are unemployed, the same boat. So let's, we've got crisis. We're trying to solve this thing. And I want you to open up your minds and think about what's going on. Those of you who are working every day, I want you to listen to what's going on. And now, here's the host of Oregon Voters Digest, Bruce Broussard. Hello, my name is Bruce Broussard. I'm a candidate for the Republican nomination for Ron Wyden's U.S. Senate seat. Yes, a black Republican with some French Creole thrown in. But I'm not running because I'm a minority. I'm running because I'm an American and longtime Oregonian. I spent 10 years in the military as a U.S. Marine. After a tour of duty in Vietnam, I was assigned as a Marine recruiter in Portland, Oregon. I like Portland and Oregon so much, I made my home here and spent several years in the Army National Guard, attaining the rank of warrant officer. I've been in business in Portland and actively volunteered thousands of hours for better schools, youth programs, job development, safer neighborhoods, and affordable housing for seniors and low-income families. As producer and host of Oregon Voters Digest, a weekly cable access TV program, I've interviewed well-known and little-known people from all sectors about community problems and solutions. Portland is just a part of Oregon. The whole state is struggling. A high unemployment rate is often more painful in Tillamook, Roseburg, Klamath Falls, Albany, Redmond, Hermston, Pillington, La Grande, Enterprise, Baker City, Ontario, Burns, or any small town. The further you are from Salem or Portland, the harder it is to get attention or help. I want to help Senator Gordon Smith work to make Oregon whole. Smaller counties and towns are the real Oregon. They deserve more attention. Senator Wyden seems more concerned with high publicity issues than he is with folks in Grant County. I doubt that Wyden has ever owned a business or had to meet a payroll. He's worked in the public sector, mostly in Washington, D.C., all of his adult life and is now removed and out of touch with Oregon. It's time for another senator from Oregon who's been an employee in the private sector and also an employer. My wife, Norma, calls that the real world. I want to learn more firsthand about your town and your county and what's needed. Norma and I will be touring Oregon soon and want very much to meet you. I need your vote to make Oregon whole again. when Mr. Broussard was running for an office, we had him at our potluck. And uh, he told us that he had, was going to do something like this. And you know, I think we have so many politicians who tell you what's going to happen if they get elected. He didn't get elected and he did it. So if he had a... If he hadn't got elected, he might have did bigger things. So next time he runs for office, let's elect him and see what he will do. Like I said, I wanted to give you a little history. I mean, that goes back 2005. Uh, you know, Ron and I are still friends. I, in fact, I think I voted for him the last time around. Um, I, in fact, you're a Republican. Oh, really? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting um, when I think about um, uh, Senator Ron Wyden. Uh, back when he was Congressman Ron Wyden, and I had the Oregon Voters Digest, 
he and I pretty well got together and we started focusing on the seniors. I mean, he basically was very much involved in the, as far as great, the, uh, you know, the Great Panthers. And uh, he's he's been a senior citizen advocate for years and years and years. And, and he's been on my show um, numerous times uh, talking about the whole issues of, of seniors and the like. And so, uh, you know, so basically he's been working for Oregon. He's been working for us. He's been working for me for, for years. Um, and that's, I've, I've not worked for him. I mean, he's worked for us, and we work together. And so, um, Victor, as you know, he is now the, the chair of Ways and Means now. You know, he's, he's really up there. He's a, he's a senior senator, and, and he's really done some great things for Oregon. And so, man, but I just thought I'd throw that, that, that little piece out there to kind of give you a sense of, of um, still, I'm still very serious about the involvement and, and, and some of the concerns that were mentioned during that particular time. We still have some of those same major concerns. And so as a result of that, I'm, I'm throwing my hat in into the, the county race aspect of it because that's, a, that's, a, that's an area that, as far as I'm concerned, talks to specifically seniors and the youth. And, uh, and I'd like to focus in that particular arena, Fred. That's, one of, that's the area that I want to focus in because when you start thinking about senior citizens, when well, you look at my gray hair, I'm going to be there. We're going to all get to that particular point. And uh, I noticed that there, was a, there were a couple of articles not too long ago that says that over 50% of our seniors, we're talking about the baby boomers now coming into, into play, over 50% of our seniors are, will basically have assets less than $100,000, if not less than that. That's, that's, that's critical. So what are we going to do? I mean, these folks are going to need housing and homes and this, that, and the other. I, I, I feel very strongly now, that after the years and whatever, that I don't think in, that there should be no senior should should uh, should have a concern with a roof over their head, clothing, food, and medical. Point blank. Point blank. That that's to happen. And in fact, when I when I look at the county, I think that um, one seat should be dedicated to seniors. One seat should be dedicated to senior citizens. We need that. And I'm thinking about Clark Pepper. Remember Clark Pepper from from the state of Florida? You know how I. I passion he was about that whole situation. Well, Ron was there. Ron basically had other things to do, but, but the fact of the matter is he took over the pathon, if you will, as far as seniors are concerned. And the other is about the youth. And again, that arena, I think about the time when I was in the Marine Corps, I spent a lot of time at JDH. At JDH. And, uh, you know, we had expungement during that particular time. And I spent a lot of time in the court system. And that was a good program because there were a lot of folks. I focused in the court system and the whole idea, I saved a lot of young folks. And by the whole idea is that you redirect them as far as getting into the criminal justice system. It's a very, so we need another program similar to that here for the youth. Very, we definitely need that. And some of those youths who are older who still retain that on their, on their resumes. And they can't go anywhere. So we need to come up with some sort of an expungement system, maybe getting together with the, with the DA, with law enforcement, the judges, and this, that, and the other, and lawyers and whatever, and sit down and come up with an expungement program that could say that, okay, fine, if they do certain things, certain things right, maybe maintain a job, um, a good father, this, that, and the other, or a good mother, and this, that, and the other, as far as I'm concerned, that would be taken off of their records. And that's a very important piece. That's a, that's a, that's a big job. We, we've had a number of programs that have gone that way. And I think we can also get away from the from the, the so-called uh, naming naming these young people and, and some of the folks who are still maintaining those as gang members. We should get that off. Get get that off their record. Get that off of their record. And that that would help. I think would help our society and get them back into a productive kind of a mindset. So that's kind of like where my where my force is. I, I can talk about a lot of other things like housing and whatever. You know, as you know, we've both been in involved in the housing business. I've, I've been in housing, I've provided housing for low-income folks, I've carried the paper, I've built seniors, I, I've done that kind of stuff. I can do a lot of other things. But I think that in this particular case, I want to make it a point to whoever's running for office or whoever's at the county to, to basically designate a seat, a designated seat there for senior citizens and young people, point blank. That's, that's my campaign, okay? <laughs> So other than that, I would hope that all these other folks that are out there running for it, whether it be city council or the like, because when you think about the city and you think about the county, it really, we, we, at one point in time, we used to talk about consolidation. You know, duplication of services is a big problem. It's a big problem. And we need to look at that. And so, so that's why I'm making the point that maybe, maybe there might be either a designee or maybe a, maybe a corporate effort between the city and Multnomah County to focus on that designee for the county aspect of it. And, and get the resources necessary to get the job done. We got to get the job done. 
I think about the food deal, the food bank aspect of it. That's another major issue. We need to we, we need to make sure. Uh, you know, I've looked at that food bank situation with Clara People. You know, she's, you know, she as far as I'm concerned, she is the mo mother of the food bank. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, they should they should rename at least the one on Marine Drive as as People's Bank, the People's Bank, which I think would make a lot of sense. But a lot of times, a lot of that food is just thrown away. It's just thrown away and then just given away to people, and people just don't know how to cook it. And in fact, I'm a, that's my first lady. My wife is going to get in there. She's very much involved in cooking. You know, you know we own this, bu this mm -hmm. business, and she's, she's the one that basically put the menu together. We need to seriously look at food because food is getting very, very pricey. And so consequently, we don't need to throw as much food. I worked for waste management with USA Waste at the time, and I was in the recycling business, and I, and I used to work at Metro, and, and we, used to do a, we used to analyze the kind of food waste that's being thrown. And a lot of this stuff could be salvaged. I mean, they, they should make sure that when they give food out, people eat it. They just don't throw it away. They don't sell it on the side or this, that, and the other. And so, so there are some things that really needs to be done. And, and I'm looking at some of the candidates that are running, and I'm having some concerns as to whether or not they're going to be related to that. But, you know, I've been involved in a lot of stuff. I just want to make sure that I get it on the platform so they can have that discussion, both for the city of Portland and Multnomah County. And if they can get that done, and hopefully we can get them, i.e., orientated to... Uh, some of the concerns that I have, that we all have for that matter. And I still take my hat off to them from, from the standpoint of standing up to the plate to run. That's a very tough time to run. People be opening up your closet and this, that. And it's tough. Tough to raise money. It takes a lot of time away from you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so anyway, that, that kind of gives you a feel for what this is all about. And at my age, you know, 76 years old, I mean, uh, should I be running at this point in time? Hey, man, you got to do what you have to do. And as, as Dr. King had made point at one point in time, he, he always made some various points, but he, the point I, I'm always interested in is that he made the point about the ultimate measure of a male, a man. Basically, I, took, I put a, a female in that too. The ultimate measure of a man or woman is not doing times of convenience and, and prosperity, but doing times of toughness and, and whatever, the dedication aspect of it. So, so even that, that, that holds the day. We need leadership. We need some strong leadership, and I would hope that the folks who are looking at various candidates are able to talk to some very serious things and get these people to speak from the heart in terms of what do they have to bring to the table to solve these problems. So with that, I'm going to throw it out to you. What do you think? Well, I'm excited that you're running, Bruce, and I hope that you win. I hope people will give you an opportunity to hear you out. Um, you've heard me on this show and other places say that one of the reasons why we're at where we're at and over the last, let's say, 10 years. I think really the last 10 years have not been very good for Portland when it comes to uh, political leadership in Portland. It's been very interesting. Is um, we are not broadening our, our, our scope as far as looking at potential candidates and giving them a good shot. Mm -hmm. We're voting for the same people that failed us the previous four years over and over again, mm -hmm. kind of in hopes that they'll win and get better. Yeah. Um, or we're just being selfish in a lot of cases and saying, well, they're doing okay for me. Mm -hmm. um, who cares what they're doing for the rest of the community? Mm -hmm. I think uh, this election cycle, all of us need to t spend a little bit more time um, looking at each one of the candidates and, giving, and, and hearing them out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. In your case, Bruce, you're so experienced. I, I, it's hard for me to believe if you were white, you would have been elected a long time <laughs> ago. A very long time ago. But uh, let me ask you this. What made you decide to run this time? Well, like I said, I was concerned about the, the, the not necessarily just the, can, the candidates, but the issues. And whether or not they're going to be focusing on the issues. Because oftentimes you've got the various groups that are opening up these so-called, they really don't really, really hone into the issues of whether or not the person will be able to perform the issues. Mm -hmm. And a thought comes to mind from the standpoint of saying that when a person applies to uh, make an application to run for office, as far as I'm concerned, we need to change the application. And that application should be such that, that it identifies the issues. And then the, when the person files, they, 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 they also would identify what do they bring to the table to solve those issues, okay? The other one is that there should be orientation. Once they've done that piece, there should be orientation to whatever office that they're running for. They should have a little orientation. Why not? It just makes good sense. Because otherwise, you know, if you've got the money, you can you can buy the necessary t folks, if you will, to make you look good, <laughs> if you will. You got my point? Uh -huh. The key is that we got to get folks 
who are going to be able to respond to the issues. And the other thing that does, by the way, Fred, is that once the person is elected, we can forget about term limit then, because if once they, if they've identified that this is what they're going to do with these issues, and then all of a sudden they don't perform to those issues, then guess what? They're not going to be there anymore. Another person is going to come up and say, okay, fine, I'm going to respond to the issues, etc. Got my point? But if they do respond, boom, no problem. Bring them back to the table. You know what I'm saying? So we need to kind of maybe look at, if, as far as I'm concerned, the application process for, for a person wanting to run for office. What is the most important issue, if you were elected, Yeah. what is the one issue four years from now you would want people to say Bruce made some movement on? Senior citizen issues. Senior citizen. I would like to make sure that, that, a, that a senior would be able to walk down to the local store and buy a loaf of bread or you know what I mean? Get out of their houses, if you will. Mm -hmm. I mean, g give them the opportunity to spend that last few years, that fourth quarter, as, as Baruti always talks about. Uh, give them that opportunity to, 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 to live their life from it. They've all, they're hardworking or whatever. You reach 70 years old, my friend. You should have the freedom to be able to at least be happy enough and not worry about some of the problems. So that's, and, and, the, and the youth. And the youth. But those are our fu futures. Those are our futures. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see something where they're, you know, they're going to schools and they're, they're graduating, if you will, and, and not, not, not more Indians, than, not, not more chiefs than, than Indians, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Because, you know, that's the blue collar. We, we've got this big push about everybody needs to go to college, but what about these jobs here, the blue collar ones, you know, the, the plumbers and the carpenters and things of that nature. Let's, let's give them the same, if you will, level aspect of it, of respect. Because then, then all of a sudden we can all go back to work, if you will. Hmm. Well, understanding that senior citizens is your number one issue yeah. in youth, where are you on economics in, in Multnomah County? Well, in, in, well, jobs. You know, everybody keeps stressing about the jobs aspect of it. I mean, I, I've been in that industry. I mean, I, I like the idea of the cart stuff, you know what I mean? But then there's the other side of it in reference to the restaurant and whatever. But it's working itself out to a certain degree. Uh, we're very service-oriented in this area, very much so in the service industry aspect of it. I, I, we got a number of farms running around uh, our area here in Multnomah County. I'd like to get back, get it back, so that the kids can go back on the farm. You know, uh, you know, we at one point in time, kids used to go back on the farm and pick berries, and got got their foods and stuff. Now they can't do that anymore. You know, it's called child child labor or whatever, whatever. And so there, there, there's some things that we can do, and then a lot of things about the caretaking for for seniors. You know, these, I'm talking about mom and dad and whatever. Why can't the husband be paid a little bit more to just take care of his wife a little bit better, you know, or, or if not that, a cousin or this, that, another. I mean, the home care aspect of it. Because you, you, you get better care when you got family taking care of folks. That's a, that's another, that's a big market. That's a major market aspect of it. And uh, so, you know, one can look at those kind of, and then visit with the private sector. Figure out what, what the bottom line is all about. What, what is it going to take to get them to, to, you know, to open up the door? Every state in the union is competing for these jobs. I mean, we got a heck of a we got a heck of a state here. We don't have the same weather conditions back east. Like, yeah, we, we 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 can attract these folks strictly in many cases just on the fact that hey, look at the climate that we have here. Huh. We're a green state all the way around. I mean, having, having gone around the state of Oregon, we got a lot of land here, and that we that folks we can really attract folks here in Oregon with industry. Where do you feel the county should fit when it comes to education? Well, you know, the county should fit, like I said, the JDH aspect of it. I'd like to beef that up again. And, you know, in all due respect, the GD, uh, G, G, GED is, is, is one thing. They need that full form of education aspect of it, just like the folks that are in, in the criminal justice system in, in Salem or whatever. As far as I'm concerned, it's not the GED aspect of it. They need that classroom kind of environment aspect of it because in most cases, that's why they're there. You got my point? So they need to have, so they need to have a, a high school diploma when they get out the institution and or if not that, and then hopefully we can do a, a, now we need to change that system to a certain degree. As far as I'm concerned, it shouldn't be just high school to 12th grade. Add two more years and give them an associate degree. We're paying for it anyway. I think a person now today, because of the expense of how much, how much it costs just to go to college, the average person can't just go. I mean, that should be one of the things that, that, that they afforded during those formative years. They, get, they come out with an associate degree. And all your trade jobs are sitting up there in, in, in the community college. I mean, I remember when D. Bernardus came to town and we took all the trades out of the Portland public schools. That was, that was a misnomer. Now we got all these young folks out here. They have nothing to, to reference, if you will. Uh, you know, what's mathematics? What's English? If you can't read, you're, you're, out of, you're, out of, you're in the criminal justice. You have nothing, nowhere to go. 
So we got to focus back on, on those practical things. Put voc ed back in those schools, and that's going to be an area that I'm going to put because I've been there. Now, with the remaining people who are in county, if you win, how do you think your your working relationship will be with them? I mean, the people who are in county right now, you know, I'm sure they're all nice people. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But Bruce did not have experience not only in life, but also in in um, street well, like he, you are. Well, Fred, you got to have my. I still have the Voters Digest. I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to leave this spot with okay. reference to the Voters Digest aspect of it. And you know, the idea is that you know, like I said, I'm just going to focus in these two areas. You know, I'm not going to be the, the county chair. You know, what I mean, in all due respect, that you know, you're going maybe Jim or, uh, or Deborah is going to going to be there. I mean, I, when I look at both of them, I mean, naturally, I tend to favor Jim a little bit because he did he tend to find with jobs. You got me, and he did. He has spent a lot of time in the in the so-called black community aspect of it. I remember there was in those days when he was trying to focus and get these young people jobs and aspect of it. So, but that's one thing. But then Deborah brings another piece, you know, uh, to the table aspect of it. But uh, so you know, I know, I know, I know Shipwreck. I know, I know her real well. You know, I know her husband, who's been in the trade aspect of it. So it's not. I'm not running for chair. <laughs> You know, I, I'm running. I'm running for the city of Portland. I'm running for the state of Oregon. We, we need to get some people who are going to be able to deal with, as you say, the background and get put some stuff on the table. I've been basically right here at the Oregon Voters Diet just talking about it. Now I got to just put some. I got to get out there and get on the table. You know, that would be outstanding. A, a sitting elected official doing something like this every week. An Oregon Voters Diet just we need show. to. We need to. We, we need wow. to. We need to demand that. If if anything, hold a press conference once a month with all of them. <laughs> what what have you, what where have you been and where are you going to go and what have you done and how many jobs have you brought to the table? <laughs> What's the biggest failure of the current group that's on Multnomah County? Not so much individually, but as a body. Well, you know, in all respect, I didn't really like the idea of Kogan the way he left in too many ways because in the private sector you get a second chance. And, and it, it was just, he was a very bright person. I supported him when he ran the first time around. I just didn't like the way that happened. As far as I'm concerned, I, I felt that the, 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 his, uh, his peers should have got together with him a bit more, the people he was working with. They, yeah. they should have got, they, they all knew that that happened. And for some whistleblower to come out on the sideline, they made it a big f fiasco aspect. They should have got together with him and said, hey, look, you got blah, 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 go to rehab or something like that and get back to the table. But we didn't do that. And, you know, some people say, well, gee, Bruce, blah, 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 routine. Well, hey, look, we all make mistakes. <laughs> you know, and, no, they were harder on him and his girlfriend more than they are on, uh, on Sam Adams. So you know how I feel about well, that. Well, we, we lost two bright people. Outstanding you know, people. Very, very outstanding people. And so that was one of the things I would say. You know, so hopefully in the future, you know, these folks will be more, a little bit more responsive. They need to include that in the policy. Give them a second shot. Yeah, let me ask you this, since you're a person that wants to get into office, Bruce, and you've been around a lot. You've talked to so many leaders, good and bad, in so many realms. How important is a per, is a, an elected official's private life to their performance as a politician, as a political leader in Portland? Well, I think in the application, you spell it out a little bit better. They need to spell it out a little bit better. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm sort of reminded when uh, President Obama, when they talked to business about the, uh, the the marijuana piece, he said, well, what are you supposed to do with it? <laughs> you just threw it out on the table aspect of it, you know. So so it's just I think we just need to spend a little bit more time in the application process and then, and then let it be known that, you know, you've got to answer the questions. If you did this, 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 that, and the other, then boom, that's okay. But the bottom line is that what do you bring to the table to create jobs? What do you bring to the table to, to deal with, with, with social issues or housing or this, that, and the other? I think that will help quite a bit and will help the society quite a bit here too. I might add too, Fred, that, you know, hopefully you, you will maybe do the same thing for other candidates. I'm going to ask you to see if you might be able to interview some of the other folks who are running for office and do the same thing you've done to me. Yeah, we'd love to. Is that fair with you? We'd love to. Okay, good. But, they'll, as, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll be fair with them. Oh, right, you, know, you know, well, I'm not going to be interviewed. But I want to say right now, I hope you win. Yeah, well, but because, way, you know, yeah, Bruce, we hope keep, we all win. We keep, put it that way. No, no, no. We this all is win. A game with, we vote for so many people who are just nice. We yeah, don't no. vote for the best candidate so often. Okay. Well, anyway, well, anyway, I, I appreciate the, I appreciate your comments, and and I hope that the viewing audience will basically do the same thing with the candidates that Fred just did. So when they're knocking on the door, or when you when you get get the opportunity to to be able to to chat with them, if you hear them or whatever. And by the way, seven minutes, folks, is just not enough time. <laughs> Uh, to be able to know a person. Give them more time. All, all you folks that are organizing, whether it be the city club or whomever, whatever, give them a little bit more time 
to speak up, but make sure you talk about the issues. Make sure you know what the issues are. Ask them the questions, especially if they're sitting. Ask them that point. What are the most critical issues that you are faced with right now? And then what are your solutions? And then share that with the other folks who are running against you. Why not? We're looking just for the best person. Fair? So anyway, folks, thank you, Fred. Thanks for the interview. Uh -huh. And thank you, folks. Like I said, uh, do the same thing that Fred has done with the rest of these folks that are running for office. And I think we'll have a better city and a better town to live in. Again, this is Bruce Broussard. I'm your host. And, hey, have a good evening. And I'll see you next time around. Take care.